All right, here we are in Acts chapter 1. Uh, Luke begins his history of the church, the early church, which is volume 2 to his gospel, which he sent to a man named Theophilus. And he starts with a bit of a recap. It's sort of like those two-part episodes of TV series. I don't watch much TV anymore, regular shows, but um, back in the old days, you know, the second episode, if they had a two-part one, they'd always sort of uh, play the little bit from the week before to get you going. And uh, sometimes they would be really cruel and they would have part one at the end of the season and you'd had to wait all summer till the fall to see part two. But whenever you got to part two, whether it was right after or uh, a, work a week later, you know, um, or um, three months later, they would usually say something. I'd show a little bit of uh, the previous episode so you could get it back in your mind. Oh yeah, that's what's going on, that kind of a thing. So they would say, something along the lines of uh, last time on Star Trek The Next Generation. Then they'd show you that. And then they'd start the, the new episodes like that. Okay, so um, Luke Volume 2 is more like Part 2 after the summer break because it's likely the gospel was in circulation while he was working on Part 2, which is the book of Acts. Part 1 is Luke's gospel. So the first verses of Acts are bringing us back to where we left off in Luke and then kind of restating some of the things that happened there. It's a good short summary. So if you look at verse 1 of Acts chapter 1, it says, The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. So this first account, the Gospel of Luke, really concludes with two main things. One is the ascension of Jesus, him ascending back into heaven before the apostles' eyes. And the second uh, thing is his final instructions to them before he ascends, okay? So the instructions in Luke, so I'm at the end of Luke right now, uh, the final orders were, this is Luke 24, 46. He said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. And that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. But you are to stay in this city until you are clothed with power from on high. So the good news about God's salvation would go into all of the world beginning from Jerusalem, that's right. So his men were to be the witnesses of all that God had done, but they were not to start their mission until they were clothed with power from on high. And that will not be uh, a purely human endeavor, will it? This going forth and taking the gospel out. Unless the promised spirit of God is working through them and with them, the great work cannot happen. That's a very important thing for all Christians to remember in terms of our own ministries too. Any real work for the kingdom is a spiritual work of God with us and in us. And that's why we don't have to manipulate anybody ever uh, into following Jesus Christ because he's going to do that work, that interior work that makes people respond. We, We can't make that happen. All we can do is share the truth. We can care about people and tell them the truth. And the truth is what the Bible says, not what I think or what somebody else thinks. We proclaim God's truth and the Spirit of God makes that effective in the heart of a person that hears it. We can't do that. He can and he does according to God's perfect will. So we can always rest in that. So these are the final orders to the apostles. You are witnesses, but wait in the city until the Spirit comes. The other thing to remember from the last volume, part one in Luke's gospel, was the ascension of Jesus, and that begins in Luke 24, 50. He led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. Very different reaction there isn't that from the time of the crucifixion when they were so dejected now they're full of joy and happiness so the ascension happens 
outside the city of Jerusalem and um, Bethany's just a bit over a mile down the road and that's where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. It's just beyond the Mount of Olives. In fact, it sounds like from Luke chapter one that the ascension is actually from the Mount of Olives. So they're right next to each other so it's probably sort of one thing in their minds. So in Acts chapter one verse three, Luke uh, recaps what happened between the resurrection and the ascension. So this is Luke's recap the, the sort of the summary of what we saw in episode 1, uh, Luke Acts 1-3. To these he presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. That's a critical reminder that the resurrection was not to be dismissed. It's the central facts. It's the central truth of the faith they were going to proclaim. It'll be at the heart of the apostolic message. There's no sermons in the book of Acts that don't talk about the resurrection. It's central to everything. That is actually what they're bearing witness to. He really is risen. So it's, it's not a metaphor. It's not a symbol of renewal or anything like that. He was raised physically in the same body that was nailed to the cross. It's a glorified body but it's a real substantial, corporeal, physical body. Okay? And that's why Luke emphasizes that Jesus was with his men almost six weeks, 40 days. So Luke says he presented himself alive. We don't know how many resurrection appearances there were overall. There are basically 10 that are recorded in some detail or at least mentioned in the Gospels and, in, and from Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. There were the women at the tomb in Matthew 28, 9 and 10, Mary Magdalene in John chapter 20, the two men walking to Emmaus, which Luke recorded in Luke chapter 24, verse 13 through 32, Peter in Jerusalem, we were just told there was an appearance there to him personally, the 10 apostles in Jerusalem, and then the 11 apostles in Jerusalem, because Thomas wasn't there the first time Jesus came to the apostles. There's seven disciples fishing in Galilee in John chapter 21, and Jesus makes them breakfast. And there's 11 apostles again in Galilee, Matthew 28, 16 through 20. And then that's probably the same as, this, as the ninth appearance, which would be 500 disciples in Galilee at the great resurrection rally, as I like to call it. And then there's James, the brother of the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 15, 7, it, it mentions that Jesus appeared to his brother James as well. So those are recorded. It's likely there were other times that Jesus was with his chosen apostles during those 40 days that are not recorded or included in any text that we have. But Luke uses the phrase many convincing proofs. So it was an overwhelming experience, a real experience. It wasn't something mystical or anything like that. In fact, that word convincing proofs is a word the Greeks used to mean um, cannot be mistaken. It's, uh, it cannot be questioned. It's just so plainly true. That's the idea there. So it was a real thing. Why do you think Luke put that there? Many convincing proofs. Why would he say that? Because it's hard to believe. It was hard for the apostles to believe. Remember? They didn't believe the women uh, who saw Jesus and touched him and had a conversation with him. So Jesus gave them many proofs. Uh, right away he ate in front of them. He let people touch him. He showed them the wounds he had from the crucifixion. He spent lots of time with them. So it was no mystical experience. It was no mirage. He was not a ghost or anything like that. He wasn't a psychological projection from people that really wanted to see him. He is risen. And in every way, Jesus made sure that it could not be doubted. Now, there were certainly more things going on during that 40 days as well like teaching the, the last phrase of verse 3 speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. So Jesus was using this time to get the apostles well grounded. Now he had taught them for many years but the things that happened in the last week of his life they didn't get all of that or what it was all about or what it told they didn't totally understand it. So how often in the gospels do the disciples seem to miss something about Jesus teaching especially when he starts talking about his death. They didn't understand it. They didn't see why that needed to happen. They thought he, maybe he was using some sort of parable or something when he was talking about it. Didn't make any sense to them. They could never quite accept it or understand it. Well now they are in a place where they accept it because they saw it happen. John saw it happen and they all know he died and now he's back. But what does it mean? What does it mean? So he has to teach them that and he's very careful to do that. 
He is the sacrifice that redeems sinful human beings when they receive Jesus by faith. His resurrection has to be understood in the light of his death for sin. And as the sacrifice that redeems sinful human beings, that's everything that they need to focus on when they're going out to preach the gospel. Jesus' teaching on the kingdom at this particular stage has to be focused on God's redemptive plan, which is all centered in him. They needed to understand the gospel they were going to be preaching. And they needed to understand it perfectly with perfect clarity so there wouldn't be any errors. That salvation is by faith in the sufficiency of the atoning work of Jesus on the cross. And people need to repent and believe that. So up till now, the apostles have been proclaiming, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now it's repent for the and, and believe for the forgiveness of sins. Repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's the new dynamic. That's in Luke 24, 47. That's what Jesus says. Early in the ministry before his death. It was the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But now it's repent for the forgiveness of sins. That's a gospel focus. So preaching the gospel. Will turn people from every tribe and tongue. Into kingdom citizens. But the kingdom itself. Will have to wait. Until Jesus returns in glory. So these men have an extensive teaching time on the gospel during these 40 days. How sinful men and women can be made righteous before God. How Christ took our sins upon himself on the cross. How we receive that as a gift. uh, His righteousness credited to us. How we need to repent and accept him as our king and savior. And how doing so lets us partake in the victory that he had over death. They had to get that right, the apostles. And from what we see in the rest of the New Testament, they did get it right. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about the coming of the Holy Spirit. Um, You can tell just in verses 4 and 5 of Acts chapter 1 how Trinitarian the passage is. It's Father, Son, Spirit all the way through. Um, Verse 4 of Acts 1, Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you've heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So the Son of God commands his men to wait for what the Father promised, which they had heard from the Son, and that is what the Holy Spirit is going to do and bring to the situation. So the promise is a wonder. It's Amazing and it marks a great change in the life of the typical believer in the New Testament time after Jesus came than there was before Jesus came. The Holy Spirit residing in a believer is something that happens after his coming and paying for our sins. In the Old Testament the Holy Spirit was around doing things but he wasn't indwelling in the same way. This is a new thing. So last time we talked how the book of Acts is a book of transition from one long standing work of God through a covenant people, a covenant nation to a new redemptive community that involves no nation states like Israel was. Instead there's going to be this spiritual community that transcends land and custom and tribe and language. All of that. So how do you have unity without a political organization or a tribal organization or some kind of overarching ecclesiastical organization of great power and great reach. How can you have unity? It's by the Spirit of God. That's how it's going to happen. All believers who are, in Jesus' words, born from above, they possess the Holy Spirit that is, he is resident within them. Someday we should do a whole series on the role of the Holy Spirit in, the, in his ministry to us as believers. But for now, just understand that that is our common bond in Christ Jesus. Wherever we live or wherever we go, it's the union of our spirits with each other through the Holy Spirit. He baptizes us into one body. Thus we are made one body by his indwelling. It's a marvelous thing. And Paul emphasizes that, remember that church, Corinth? It was having so much trouble and division and he writes to the Corinthian church and he reminds them in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 12. He says, for even as the body is one and yet has many members and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body. 
so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body whether Jews or Gentiles whether slaves or free and we were all made to drink of one spirit. You see how profound the unity of the church is in the Holy Spirit. That's a very great truth. It's one of the most profound aspects of the Christian life that we have this unity in the Holy Spirit. All true Christians are baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. That's not just a conceptual unity, an idea. It's a spiritual reality. That's why anywhere you go in the world, there's an immediate connection. If you've traveled to other places and met genuine Christians there, there's a connection, there's a bond, there's an amazing unity of the Spirit in the universal body of Christ. So the coming of the Holy Spirit's a, a, a very big deal. And the apostles are, are not to move until he comes. They're not to start anything until he comes. And once it happens to Jesus' Jewish disciples, which is coming up really soon in chapter 2, later it's going to happen to a gathering of, can you guess? That's right, Gentile. Gentile believers, as they receive Jesus, the same thing is going to happen to them. So it's a miracle that happens twice, this coming of the Holy Spirit in a dramatic fashion to show God's acceptance of the Gentiles. We'll be getting to that much later in Acts. But that's what Jesus is talking about in verses 4 and 5, the coming of the Spirit to unify all believers in one body. Indeed, the promise of the the Father, the promise of the Father in verse 4, refers to Jesus' words at the end of Luke's gospel, Luke 24, 49. But that promise isn't explained by Luke there, uh, just that there is a promise of the Father. But now in verse 5, it's a clear reference. He talks about John the Baptist, who baptized with water in preparation for Messiah's coming. John himself said in Luke chapter 3, verse 16, As for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So the promise of the Father is the Holy Spirit who will baptize believers into one body and empower them to serve the Lord in ministry. It's it's really in John's gospel in the great uh, discourses at the Last Supper which covers many chapters in John much more than the other Gospels where we really see the Holy Spirit explained in much more detail. I just want to read you one text from that. Now one of the most encouraging of those passages is John 14 16 which says um, Jesus is speaking he says I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth. Whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. That's the great change right there. From an old covenant believer to a new covenant believer. It's an amazing promise. But in Acts the Spirit's coming is a big event. Two big events like I said. And in our narrative the first big event is going to happen pretty soon. Because the coming of the Spirit happened on the day of Pentecost, which is 50 days, that's where the Pentapart comes in, 50 days after Passover. And Luke's told us that Jesus was with, with his disciples for 40 days after Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. So we're more than 40 days after Passover in this scenario here we're looking at in Acts chapter 1 when we come to the Ascension story. Before the Spirit comes, Jesus has to leave. He actually says that in John's Gospel as well. And that's what these verses are about. It's his time to leave has come. And so he's telling them, verse 5, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And it won't be long after he's gone, just a matter of days. Now, something interesting happens right after that. The apostles in verse 6, their minds are unsettled about something. One thing that has not been addressed for them at least uh, in all the teaching that Jesus has done is when the kingdom comes I mean, where that comes in where, where's the glorious kingdom on earth with the Messiah ruling on the earth as described so profoundly in the Old Testament so many times where, where is that? What about the kingdom? When's it coming? So now that they, they see they understand now that redemption was necessary the cross 
was necessary to achieve redemption. That's God's provision for man's reconciliation. But what about the kingdom? Where is it? So they're wondering if the coming of the spirit is the event that will inaugurate Messiah's glorious kingdom on the earth. Verse 6. Lord, they ask this question. Is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? So they're still thinking in the traditional Jewish way, which is totally consistent with the Old Testament, that Israel will be the capital of the world with Messiah as the king of the world. That's going to happen sometime. So um, that's what they ask him. Are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? Now? Is that about to happen now? And his answer is really important. In fact, it's essential for any proper theology of the kingdom. Verse 7, he said to them, it is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. That is quite an answer that one they did not expect to their question. Is it at this time? It's not for you to know. Very important question. Very clear answer. Yes, the kingdom of the Messiah is coming. It's not for you to know when. Now, I don't understand how some Christians would say there's going to not be an earthly kingdom. That the kingdom is only spiritual. Uh, If that were the case, Jesus could have said very simply, fellas, you're missing it. It's a spiritual kingdom now. There's no Israel involved in all of this, you know. Don't be looking for a messianic age on earth. That, we've we're changed that program. But he doesn't say anything like that. Au contraire. Jesus wasn't kidding when at the last supper he told them this. This is in Luke chapter 22 verse 28. You are those who have stood by me in my trials. And just as the father has granted me a kingdom. I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Wow, that's a promise. And they're asking if that promise is going to be fulfilled anytime soon. He's saying, don't worry about that. You need to focus on the task at hand. You shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. So the size and scope of that job, that ministry of proclamation of the gospel That sounds like it's going to be quite a long time uh, before the kingdom comes. And indeed we, we know that it is. But it will come. It will come. To reinforce this reality of Christ coming to claim the earth. We have the words of the angels. So if you don't get it from what Jesus said. The angel is going to confirm that. Following the ascension. So let's see how Luke describes the ascension starting at verse 9. After he had said these things he was lifted up. While they were looking on. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky. While he was going. Behold two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said. Men of Galilee. Why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven. Will come in just the same way. As you have watched him go. Into heaven. Well, you can't be any clearer than that. All, all the cults and all the errant theologies that say Christ returned in the spirit or he's visibly come back, but not really, he's not going to come back physically. These words forbid you from believing those kinds of things. He hasn't returned, but he will. He hasn't set up his kingdom, but he will. This is not the messianic age, but it will be the messianic age. What's going on right now? What's been going on for 2,000 years since this happened? God is saving millions of people, making them his children, turning rebels into children who will live with him forever in glory. That's what he's doing right now. The gospel is being taken to the remotest parts of the earth. That work, well, it's nearing completion, I think, isn't it? We're getting there. But people are giving their lives today to continue To spread that gospel to the remotest parts of the earth. They are sowing seeds and reaping the harvest. 
A key phrase from the angel is that Jesus will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. The same way. There's a direct parallel between what scripture says about Christ's return and what we see here in this passage with his departure. According to verse 12, he departed from the Mount of Olives. Well, Zechariah 14.4 says he will set feet, his feet on the Mount of Olives when he returns to rule. He ascended visibly. Matthew 24.30 says they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with, of the sky with power and great glory. They're going to see it. It will be visible when he returns. Verse 9 here says a cloud received him out of their sight as he ascended. Matthew 24, 30 again says he will come on clouds with power and glory. So in major supernatural events in the Bible, the word clouds is often used to describe God's glory. So it's not necessarily a vapor, water vapor or a mist or something like that. It was a cloud of glory. That's especially true regarding God's association with the tabernacle. Uh, the tent of worship, but also at other times and other places. His, the, his, the cloud is a cloud of glory. It's light. It's not darkness. It's light. In the transfiguration of Jesus, uh, this is a good example, Matthew 17, a bright cloud overshadowed the scene there and God spoke. So his coming will be much like his leaving. An angel said so. It's going to be the same way. So you can rely on that. All right, so the apostles must wait for power from on high, wait for the Holy Spirit before they can bear witness to what God has done in Christ to the world. And that'll be just a week or so away. So what should they do before then for for the next week? Jesus has gone up into heaven. The angels have gone away. What are they going to do while they're waiting for the Holy Spirit to come? Well, they're going to gather and they're going to pray together. They're going to be together. Remember when I quoted Jesus a bit ago from uh, Luke 22, 29, where it said, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel? Well, Jesus told us in that text, how many thrones? He said, truly I say to you that you you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. How many thrones? Yeah, there's 12. How many apostles are there? 11. There's only 11 apostles. They need a replacement for Judas. That that has to happen. It's time to pick a new man. So one thing they're going to do before the Holy Spirit comes as they gather and pray together is pick a new man to be the 12th apostle. And that, we'll see how they did that next time. Okay, let's pray. Ah, Lord, you are absent but you are present you we can be in your kingdom now as citizens but we have to wait for it as well how great it will be and how great the privilege to serve the interests of the kingdom in this world which still is in rebellion against you we pray that your kingdom would indeed come and come soon we know it will we know that you'll return as you left here bodily to reign upon the earth in a glorious kingdom for a thousand years we rejoice in the very thought of it we can't wait to see it we ask you to help us to continue the work you've given the apostles to do and by extension all christians that follow them to keep the gospel moving to new people in new places all the time in your precious name we pray amen all right so next week we'll see how they pick that new apostle we'll see you then